The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tommy O'Brien, coming to you live from TFNN Friday morning, just after 9 a.m. Eastern Time. We got about 24 minutes to go until the start of trading and we got a lot happening this morning as we come into friday action with markets clawing back some of the losses over the last couple of days you're talking about folks about 140 points quite the sell-off from where you were wednesday morning trading at a price point of 4508 you dive down talking about 142 points to be exact low of 4366 overnight we've jumped a little bit higher over that high you're looking for some fibonacci numbers Excuse me, you're talking about an area, even a 382 gets you back to about 4420. It's been quite a sell off. We'll see where we go. Friday action, we're getting a little bit of a reprieve. But boy, the day is young. We got 22 minutes until the opening bell. We got stocks higher across the board. NASDAQ 100, you're up by about 90 points. That's six tenths percent in the positive. You get the Dow right now up by 36 points, one tenth percent in the positive, And the Russell, positive by five. That's about three tenths percent. Crude, Positive yet again. We're up by 96 cents on the session. We're trading at $90.60 for the price of crude. Excuse me, gold contract catches a bid. You're up by $7 as we have basically a little bit of a reversal of everything that's been happening over the last couple of days. In excuse me, a little bit of a hiccup there. In terms of yields, in terms of dollar, everything, just a little bit of easing of the tensions. You get the 10 year right now up by five ticks. When you're talking about yields, 10-year pushing about 4.47 percent the two-year about 5.12 percent we were almost at 5.2 percent on the 10-year yesterday uh so excuse me on the two-year we were almost at 5.2 percent on the two-year yield yesterday the 10-year was at about 4.5 percent and we're sitting at about 4.47 so slight reprieve but boy you put the 10-year on a daily <laughs> Doesn't look like much of a reprieve on that chart, man, right? Check it out. I mean, even from where you were in May, imagine buying the 10-year in May at 117, and boom, just like that, you're at almost 108. You talk about a capital loss if you need to sell that thing and not hold it for 10 years. You jump over to the two-year over that time. You jump back to where you were in May. I mean, the two-year, you're supposed to be pretty protected. And yeah, you hold the two-year for two years, you'll get your yield. And that is a great argument, man. You, you buy the two-year at 5.12% right now. You don't have to worry about capital if you're going to hold it for two years. You're going to get your 5%. But just back in May, you're buying the two-year at almost 104. Back in March, you're buying the two-year at 104.11. And just like that, you lose what? Almost 25 to 3% if you're buying that. So, man, just mammoth moves on the short end of the curve, moves on the larger end of the curve as well. That, of course, impacting the dollar index. Dollar. They back it up to we were just talking about May. You're at 101. Right. March, you were back here at actually 104. It's been a one way trip to higher prices, man. We're sitting at 10548 right now. We go back to a short term time frame on a 10 minute chart. And as you can see, though, a little bit of a pullback from the highs we got yesterday morning. You have the dollar index pushing 10573. And we are just back a bit at 10548. We jump around to some of the other currencies this morning. Dollar yen with some action. We're back to 148.25 from the lows of yesterday of pushing 147. We jump over to the euro US dollar right now. 106 handle for the euro US dollar. Dollar strength, man. And that seems to be the consensus going forward. We jump over to the VIX volatility index. 1754 was where we got to yesterday, man. Put this thing on a daily. We've been chopping around. You're coming coming back to the highs of August, that high of 1888. We got, what, 17, what did I just say, 1754 yesterday. So just coming up to the highs of August, quite the acceleration. Can this time be different? We got about five, six weeks until the next Fed meeting. A lot of pressure on the markets as we await the next Fed meeting. Not sure what gives this market a bid. Maybe we have a little bit of a consolidation in this market. Just talking about on this program yesterday, okay, this area here that I have highlighted 
is an area of confluence, folks. Keep your eye on it, okay? Because number one, you take the area that we were in in March, the one-way trip to higher prices, that's an area of 3,800 and change up to 4,600. You had an 800-point run in the S&P over a period of about five months, okay? The 618 of that area brings you down to about 4,150. All right, that's the lower boundary of that confluence area. And then you take the flash low back about a year ago of 3,500, you take it to the same high, and you're talking about the 382 is at about 4,200. So an area of confluence, folks, is two different, two different Fibonacci retracement areas of two different trends and how they line up. And there's your 382, there's your 618, there it is on the chart. What I think is so cool about this area is that this is a natural area of retracement. This is an area that was resistance. Maybe that's your area of support. You were up back there in December, you were back there in February, and you chopped around there before you really started the acceleration in June from a period of about March up until that acceleration in June, uh, May, June, when you're just jammed from 4,100 up to 4,600 on some of the AI craze, pushing that above that 4,200. 4,200 had been a ceiling for some time, even you back it up on a three-year weekly, right? You can see that area, if you stretch it to the left, you did get above it in August. You got up to a high of 4,327, but that was short-lived. That was just before you dove down to the cycle lows of 3,502, but also the area you were at last May. So, Keep your eye on that 4150 to 4200 area, man. We're not that far off. I was saying yesterday, right? Market's been down 100 points in a couple days, and you're only talking about basically 200 points from that area. And what happened throughout the day just yesterday, right? Just since I was on the air yesterday, man, got off the air at what? 10 o'clock. The market was at 4406. By the time you were trading in the after hours, you dropped 40 points to 4366. So we got volatility back right now. This market's trying to figure things out. You got yields in the mix as well. And you got dollar strength carrying forward as well. See if the markets can handle it. We will see. All right, let's jump around to some of the headlines of the day. We'll kick it off with the market wrap from Bloomberg. U.S. futures signal some respite after bruising week. Yeah, 10-year Treasury yield touched 4.5%. We talked about that. Bank of America is talking about rate concerns spark the biggest stock outflows of the year. Right? How about that one, man? And it looks like uh, Microsoft. They're going to get their deal done with Activision Blizzard. Buffett for... You know, keep your eye on Buffett. He's not always right, man. But he went into that thing looking for a little bit of an arbitrage opportunity, saying, hey, I'm going to buy some Activision Blizzard. I think the deal's getting done. I think there's enough in there to make the risk reward profitable. And even if it doesn't get done, so I still like kind of where this equity is at. Well, guess what? Looks like it's going to get done, man. Uh, Activision Blizzard gaining in the pre-market as Microsoft's acquisition of the company looked to set to clear the final regulatory hurdle and uh, – yeah, let's jump over. Why not? ATVI, I believe it says. Yeah, there it is, man. Um, where did Buffett get in a while ago? Look at the volatility on this thing as it's lived and died on some of the news coming out. going to be interesting to see how this plays out in the future, man. Microsoft has said that they're not going to use this to be anti-competitive. I'm not sure if you know how business works, but there's no way that's going to be the case going forward. Uh, Microsoft makes the Xbox. They're buying one of the biggest game makers out there. There's no way that they're not going to try and use those games to gain an advantage for the Xbox, even though they say those games will be available on all platforms for a period of X years. Nonetheless, the deal seems to get done. Activision Blizzard, higher in the pre-market. We got Microsoft shares right now, higher with the market as well. Stay tuned, folks. It's Friday. Back in three minutes. Don't go away. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. 
Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything, from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. I got a chart of Amazon up here. Quite a pullback yesterday, down to 128. You're up to 131. Some context here. It's been quite a run for Amazon shares. You kick off the year at about $81. Remarkable. Up to 145 almost. You're pushing back to 129, but this morning you're up about a buck 70. That's about a percent and a half to the upside at 131 as volatility persists in a big way. I'm reading an article on the journal this morning about Amazon. This will be an interesting one to see how it plays out and see what consumers really value here. So they're talking about a couple of low discount competitors here. The headline is Amazon's new challenge, bargain retailers that are playing a different game. The different game is they're not delivering items in two days. So that's where it's really going to get interesting, right? And Amazon, with their prime, I wouldn't say they service only affluent customers, but they are geared towards a more affluent customer when you consider the fact that you're paying for Prime, you're ordering multiple products, etc. You have the ability to pay a slight premium for that. Um, but they got Shine and Timu. Not familiar with Timu. I am familiar with Shine. And they talk about, okay, these both have Chinese roots. And they're tapping into demand for low price items that aren't delivered quickly. And that's where it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, are we going to go back to preferring to allow things to get delivered at a longer term basis for a more affordable price? I mean, wherever you are on the income spectrum, I'm sure at some point you are willing to save money and wait a little bit for your product. Uh, and what they talk about here is that inside, inside of Amazon, executives have been weighing how to respond to the two competitors. And Amazon has not yet taken steps to match the prices of the items on Timu. They probably can't if it's got that long to get delivered, right? Because part of the reason why Amazon got the prices they got is that, man, they'll drop it at your door within four hours in some locations, depending on where you are. Inside of Amazon, execs have been weighing on how to respond to the two competitors. There is a market for bargain items that take longer to arrive and have tried to figure out 
if they should make such offerings in their own sight more discoverable and available. So this is like a big picture deal, right? What do consumers want? What are they willing to pay? Is there enough profit to be made on that side of things? Shine and Timu aren't going after two-day delivery or better customer service. They seem to be hitting the lower end cheap stuff that people are willing to wait for. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me, a little bit of a sneeze there. Uh, inflation wary American customers have increasingly been willing to try out these two services uh, since launching in the U.S. services in September of 2022. Timu's website and app, a measure for how often shoppers are visiting, grew by more than 10 times to about 70.5 million. That's monthly unique visitors. 70.5 million is the number. Since August of 2021, Shine's U.S. monthly unique visitors nearly doubled to roughly 41 million in March. Amazon's monthly unique visitors decreased to 211 million in March from about 217 million in September. Not what you want to see right? If you're out there. But nonetheless, it's not surprising, man. There are certain items, folks. I mean, I know Shine, what are they big on? Clothing, right? Or they, I don't know. That's in my household. Um, clothing, teenage girls, clothing is what they were looking at there. And that's something that, yeah, you know, you're buying some clothes. You don't need to come in uh, the next day. Maybe you're willing, especially at the right price. Some of those items, man, just uh, very, very affordable on those two apps. So that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. They recently opened a marketplace for U.S. customers. This is Shine, creating a channel for independent merchants to sell products through its site. Thousands of Amazon sellers have joined the new platform. So it's a wild new frontier, man. And it's so interesting to see how it actually might go backwards on the other way, right? Amazon plowed forward, two-day delivery. But guess what? Now you can get two-day delivery if you want. But now consumers are price conscious yet again. And what happens if you're price conscious well if you're willing to wait a few days or even a few weeks at times okay that's the kicker here maybe you're willing to go to that service and forego amazon they ship many products directly from china based on consumer demand instead of having large inventory sitting in warehouses in advance so that's you know that's a business plan that amazon probably can't match um it's a completely different business model and i think amazon's going to be shy to go there and I wonder how much actual profit is in that business when you're selling at such low price points and delivering it over a few weeks. Nonetheless, uh, interesting, right? All right, we jump to the automakers. The next strike is coming. Hey, can you tell the <clears throat> can you tell the the Halloween costumes that I've been looking for 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 Tommy this year? Can you tell how I'm getting tagged? Um, yeah, he might be a dinosaur. I think this is the one he's going to be. He's going to be ste Stegosaurus uh, Skeleton. That's the one, maybe. HalloweenCostumes.com. They'll get a free plug because I was over there. I did uh, purchase a Halloween costume for Tommy. I think that's the one he's going to be. I think so. There it is again. They're everywhere, folks. Right? No tiger. I know. He's got his tiger off it, but he's a, he's a dinosaur man these days. Um, the UAW poised to expand the strike to more auto factories. The union leader scheduled to identify strike locations Friday morning. So it's coming. I think it was by noon today, right? Is that what he was talking about? If we don't have any severe progress by noon today, he's going to instruct walkers to walk out of more factories unless serious, pro pro serious progress is made. And, uh, yeah, so you got about 12,700 workers have been on strike for a week at three plants, one for each automaker. It's got to be pretty tough if you're one of the workers that somehow just goes on strike first, right? doesn't seem quite fair. going to be interesting to see how they hold the line here. Negotiator, negotiators have been meeting all week, but publicly the sides have reported little progress. Um, the latest counteroffers from the company settled at around 20% wage increases over four years, among other benefits. The union has called these offers insufficient, and they're looking for mid-30% wage increases down from the initial 40. Well... So they're moving. They're moving towards the middle, but they still got a 15% gap in the middle. And as I said, man, there is so much more important stuff that goes on in these negotiations more than just the wage number. The wage number is a big number, of course, okay? But whether you're talking about sick leave, um, whether you're talking about the ability to move workers to different plants, right? The devil's always in the details. I'm sure there are many details that go into something like this. The pay matters, of course, and those are the numbers that catch all the headlines because they're tantalizing. But it'll be interesting to see where we go. Let's see. GM president wrote an opinion piece in the Detroit Pre-Fress. 
accusing, this is the union's team of misrepresenting the company's ability to afford the union's demands. He said 85% of union, GM's unionized workers would earn a base wage of about $82,000 annually under the recent GM proposal. I don't know if that's enough, man. You know, he's touting that saying, hey, come on. I don't know if that's enough. In the, in the days of, well, what's the UPS driver getting? Like 140000 at the end of the completion here? GM's making a lot of money, man. $82,000 a year. I don't know if that's what it used to be, especially if they're talking about the end of the contract. You know, I think he's putting that number out there, thinking that that will wow a lot of people, and it may. But I think we're all aware of what, I mean, can you afford a house on $82,000 a year right now with a 7.5% mortgage? Let's have that conversation, right? Can you afford a car? Can you afford the groceries that go with it? I mean, put that in, in context there. Um, yeah, $82,000 is a great paid wage if you're coming in there. But that's talking about almost everybody. And if you're in there for a while, man, it seems like you might be deserving to make more than $82,000 as a union employee working for GM for an extended period of time. It seems like you should be able to afford a house. And I don't know if you can afford a great house right now with where rates are and where housing prices are. All right, folks, stay tuned. We're coming back for the open. Adding stock options to your portfolio can be a major game changer. But the full complexities of these instruments can oftentimes elude even the most experienced traders. Whether you're a seasoned trader looking to sharpen your knowledge on options or you're completely new to the market, Teddy Kekstat is here to help. On Wednesday, September 27th, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Teddy is hosting a live stream that will teach you how to capitalize on time with calendar stock option spreads. Teddy will also go over how to trade stocks and other market movements without large capital allocation, how to expand portfolio diversification, how to maximize potential returns, basic entry and exit techniques, and more. If that wasn't enough of a reason to attend, Teddy will also be answering all questions live. If you're serious about making money in this market, head over to the front page of TFNN.com today to sign up for Teddy's live stream. TFNN, educating investors. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen, as well as many more. And he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30 year T bonds as they both influence Forex markets tremendously. When you sign up for the Tiger Forex Report, you also gain instant access to Teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted, Forex Strategies and Fundamentals, What is Behind the Tiger Forex Report. For all the details and to start your 30-day Tiger Forex Report subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV.
Welcome back, folks. we got markets open. You get a little bit of a pullback coming into that opening bell. We go into a five-minute chart right coming into it, right? Five minutes before the opening bell, even you back it up. About 8.30, we had pre-market session highs of 43.90. We give up 10 S&P points just like that. you got the NASDAQ. We're up by 65 points. Dow actually inches into negative territory just below the lows of yesterday in the open right now. Dow off 18. You get the Russell positive by six. We check in on yields. You jump over to the 10-year right now. 108.15, chopping around, but you pull back a little bit on yields right now. And we talk about the 10-year, 4.48 we're inching towards. The two-year rises a bit as well for yield. Yeah, as we pull back from 101.10 to 101.09, one tick. But these moves on the two-year, the 10-year, and we check in on the dollar index right now. Yeah, coming back to some strength. The day is young, man. You want to ride this one into the weekend? I don't know, folks. I was talking about it yesterday. I mean, I would put 4,200 on your chart right now. The risk-free rate of return, man, it's very attractive. I talk about it often. But we got some headwinds in this market, and we got a Fed that's not playing games, man. And the market's uh, trying to figure that one out as fast as they can. With the market sitting right where we were on June 12th, okay? And it's pretty remarkable when you look at the fact that you go back to February... And we're only 180 points above where we're at. And this is where the context of everything starts to matter, okay? So you're 180 points above where you're at in February. And yeah, I'm cherry-picking the highs of February, okay? But I'm not cherry-picking the high of December, which you got a flash high of 4180. So you're 200 points above where you were at in December, which is about nine months ago. And that's about a 5% return, which is basically your risk-free rate of return right now. Okay, now that doesn't take the cherry pick low at 35 or 2. There's a lot of, of highs and lows within here. But we may see some consolidations, man. I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna throw big picture five-year weekly for a second. And you know what? Let's throw it on the monthly to remind everybody, okay? <clears throat> and let's take off these Fibonacci numbers because they get a little con congested up here. All right, so let's zoom in here. Whoops, one more. Let's take that one off as well. Let's back things out. Folks, the area that we're looking at for a possible pullback is right here at 4,200, okay? Do you see the run we've had since the financial crisis? Do you see the run we've had since uh, the taper tantrum back? No, that's the taper tantrum, excuse me. Yeah, that's COVID. Man, time flies. Um, context is important, folks, okay? And keep that in mind, considering where we are. Kind of looks like a double top in that market when you put it big picture. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. And the great thing, I was talking to our man Kevin Hinks yesterday from Fast Mark on the Schwab Network every day, 12 noon Eastern time right here on Tiger TV. And he's saying the economy's strong, man. And the economy is strong. Okay, inflation is the problem right now. This economy is stronger than ever. You've, Fed just upgraded its forecast for GDP from 1% to 2.1%, right? They just talked about they don't even see unemployment getting above about 1, 4.1%, even as we weather higher for longer rates. The economy is very strong, but sometimes that does not mean stocks go up. And that's the part that you should really try and wrap your brain around, okay? Protect yourself. We talk about technicals on this show all the time. We talk about specific equities. But boy, it has been a quite a run in the markets, folks, from 665 to 4,400, okay? I mean, what is that? Let's do 4,400 minus 665. We're talking about, I mean, so you're up 3,700 points in the S&P, which is a 561% return from the lows, and that's over a period of 15 years, which means uh, you divide it by 15, you're pushing 37% a year, okay? That's cherry picking the low of 665, but you're up 37% and it's not even 15 years. That's doing 15 years, okay? So be careful in this market. That's all we're going to say there. The multiples are lofty. We'll see where we go from there. But higher for longer might mean that with a stronger economy, we might not deserve to be at 4,500 in this market. And boy, you know, we all know how technicals look, man. One thing I talk about as well that kind of resets the context of where we are in this market, talk about this before as well. President Trump was elected in November of 2016. You can't even see 
the the wildness that happened on his election night leading up to that. Remember, the futures crashed. Uh, they rebounded and were dramatically higher over the overnight session. You talk about some volatility, right? The reason why I bring it up is because the S&P was sitting at about 2150, 2200 at that price range. And whether you believe it or not, a lot of the rhetoric went around saying, man, you know, President Trump inherited this great economy that just went from 600 to 2200, right? It's a one-way trip. He inherited it continues higher. Remember how well everybody thought the market was doing when the S&Ps were sitting at 2200 when President Trump was elected. You know, a lot of liberals out here out there were saying of course it's going up he inherited this great economy okay remember the consensus of how everybody felt when the market was sitting at 2200 in November of 2016 well we're seven years later and we're up by a hundred percent we're at 4400 versus 2200 okay and a hundred percent divided by seven is a 14.3 percent return over those seven years, and that is taking the point in time when everybody said the market is so great. It's not fair to attribute the gains because we're on a one-way trip to higher prices and we're already doing so well. I'm not taking the lows of 660, okay? I'm taking the November 2016 price point of 2200. We've doubled that in a period of about seven years, not even seven years, okay? And that is a 14.3% return every year for the last seven years after, and that's after the market went from 660 to 2200, okay? We got a COVID pullback in there. We got our 2022 pullback in there when the Fed started hiking. But all things considered, folks, make sure you protect yourself, okay? Because there's a risk-free rate of return out there. We're going higher for longer. And yes, the big worry is you, you lock yourself into that risk-free rate of return if you're young, the economy is going to be fine, folks. You know, you weather the storm. You'll be OK. Um, have diversification in this market. And I know I'm a little bit all over the place, but context is important. And I think people forget how good you felt when the S&Ps were at 2200. Right. I think we all forget how great it felt when the S&Ps were at 2200 when President Trump got elected. Things were great, man. Right, we came roaring out of the financial crisis. The markets went from 665 up to above 2,000. We're holding the well. You tear up from there. You come into COVID at about 3,200. The world seems like it's going to be over. We go back to 2,200, and before you know it, you're at 4,800. So just put that in context of where we are, because if you think that testing these lows of last year is out of the question, you know, and I'm not saying they're going to happen. I'm only talking about 4,200 right now, but you better believe it's possible, folks, because there might be some lag in this market. And um, we might need a little bit of a repricing going on as we come into, I mean, the multiples are bonkers, okay? And AI is gonna be revolutionary on a generational basis. But do you see the bar we got on a monthly basis on NVIDIA, folks? Do you see the euphoria? Does that look a little parabolic? So protect yourself, okay? Protect yourself in this market because things are a little bit parabolic. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be talking individual equities when we, when we get back. Stay tuned. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. 
Direction Leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. Adding stock options to your portfolio can be a major game changer, but the full complexities of these instruments can oftentimes elude even the most experienced traders. Whether you're a seasoned trader looking to sharpen your knowledge on options or you're completely new to the market, Teddy Kekstat is here to help. On Wednesday, September 27th, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Teddy is hosting a live stream that will teach you how to capitalize on time with calendar stock option spreads. Teddy will also go over how to trade stocks and other market movements without large capital allocation, how to expand portfolio diversification, how to maximize potential returns, basic entry and exit techniques, and more. If that wasn't enough of a reason to attend, Teddy will also be answering all questions live. If you're serious about making money in this market, head over to the front page of TFNN.com today to sign up for Teddy's live stream. TFNN, educating investors. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. Markets rolling over a bit, man. We're down to 43.77. Basically, right near session lows where you were chopping around, you got the NASDAQ 100. They give it up as well. We're at 14,896. We just gave up almost 100 points. Let's check in on some of the FANG stocks, see how, see how we're trading. You got Amazon catches a lift after the demise of yesterday, though. Up 1.3% for Amazon. The big dog, Apple, they give up the gains it had up about two-tenths percent. You jump over to Microsoft on the heels of that Activision Blizzard deal probably getting done. Down about three-tenths percent. Not really probably an Activision Blizzard um, deal. That stock up about 1.8% on the final hurdle, potentially being cleared. We jump over to Tesla. Tesla off about 1%. Going to be interesting to see. Elon's got to love the auto workers um, striking for the competitors, man. Tesla, non-union. You're going to see that play out if that persists in a big way. We jump over to some of those automakers. Oh, look at what we got, man. Do we have any progress getting made? Maybe we do. Ford up a 2% on a spike. Look at the volatility, man. GM up about half a percent. Not sure if there's any news. Let me, let, let me know in the den if there's a reason why they're spiking on some news there. I know today's an important day. Yeah, so announcement at 10 a.m., huh? 17 minutes. We'll see the volatility. Everybody getting their trades in order on the automakers as they spike higher. They give it up a bit with the S&Ps barely in the positive right now. So the news just hits the wire. I have to chuckle almost a little bit, man. These politicians, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. And there's a few things, folks, that, that you know, we can all agree on. And that's the corruption in politics. That's possibly term limits, I think, would help that in a dramatic fashion. Um, the way that it's a one-way mill from being a politician to a lobbyist. There's a lot that we could do. And unfortunately, the people in charge of that are the people that we want to limit. So it's very difficult. I saw one bill yesterday talking about... Um, the age. Now, here's where things get really complicated in my mind, right? And this is all to do with you got Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey, a Democrat. Now, he's the chair right now of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. That's probably somebody you don't want getting bribed, okay? And they're not talking about the Foreign Relations Committee. I think this is just to do with business in his own state. But nonetheless, he is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's chaired that once before when Democrats were in control of the Senate, and he and his wife have been charged with bribery. Indicted in New York on federal bribery charges related to an allegedly corrupt relationship with three businessmen. They got a press conference at 11 a.m. to follow, so you get the auto workers at 10. You get the Bob Menendez indictment press conference at 11. We got some good press conferences uh, coming up today.
Yeah, three counts. That's only a conspiracy to commit bribery, conspiracy to commit honest services fraud, and conspiracy to commit extortion under color of official right. So that news just hit, man, as I come on. Um, he has been in the Senate in, since 2006. I was just looking this up. You know who put him in the Senate, folks? You know who put him in the Senate? John Corzine. That's who put him in the Senate. Uh So in January of 2006, he was appointed to fill the U.S. Senate seat being vacated uh, by Corzine. Excuse me. Okay. So Corzine was elected governor of Jersey. It's funny how everybody, right? In 2006, he vacated that. Menendez goes into it. Menendez had been serving as a House member. Yeah, I think he has been indicted a few times. I thought that as well, man. Um, I, it's tough to keep track now, right? Isn't it a bummer that it's literally tough to keep track of how many times people are getting indicted if they're getting indicted multiple times? Um, I remember. Um, and so maybe they finally got him this time. I'm not sure. But he was a House member from 1993 to 2006. He got put in the Senate in 2006. And this is where things get bonkers, man. So the Senate, Senate's a six-year term, man. Those senators, they got it made, right? You win one election, you're in for six years. House members, two years. They keep it local. They make sure you're accountable at all times to, to your local constituents in the House. And man, our founding fathers, they just were brilliant on so many fronts in terms of making sure that the House members have to run so often. You got the Senate. They're responsible for the state. They have a longer term in there. They both have equal powers in Congress. Um, but so he has been a senator since 2006. And when you think about that, right, you're talking about almost 20 years. So he ran in 2012. But think about it. He got put in in 2006, was appointed to fill that Senate seat, and he got to be there for six more years and he wasn't even elected. That's the stuff that doesn't feel right. And then he runs twice more. And then you got him chairing the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. OK, now he did chair the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, once prior to where he is right now. He chaired that from 2013 to 2015. And he's been the chair again since 2021. Um, but at a, at a time when, you know, partisan politics are the worst in my lifetime, Compromise is necessary, folks, and I think there are some things that we could all compromise on, and you got to get over the hurdle of the people that are controlling things, but term limits is probably one of them. And I don't know what those term limits are, and that's going to be a disagreement as well, but we've all seen it played out. We've seen it play out, um, unfortunately, Mitch McConnell, right, having some issues, man. Um, hopefully, he is just healthy because it's really rough watching that play out. Um, Jeez, I'm losing her name. The the woman from California that I should know who who was struggling um, as well. And then, of course, you get the two gentlemen that are going to be running for president, Biden and Trump, that, that are very old as well. What I will say, Feinstein, thank you, Diane Feinstein. Um, it's very difficult. The voters, the voters, I, I don't like when the government puts limits on who you can elect by talking about age. Because then everything becomes the people who write the rules. The voters got to have the most flexibility you can to keep democracy. So that's the tough part about putting age limits on something, okay? Now, you want to put an age limit on 95 on something, then we can probably get in business, right? But who, who says where that line is, right? We'll say, okay, you can't be 100 if you run for office. I think we'll all agree on that. What about 95? I think we'll all agree on that. What about 90? Maybe we'll agree on that. Who makes that line? Is it 85? Is it 80? Is it 75? Is it 70? One um, congressman, I think, was just talking about, or congresswoman, saying maybe 75 would be the number. But that's always going to be a political tool, folks, okay? Because maybe you've got a 76-year-old running. OK, who is a very youthful 76 year old. And all of a sudden you got Congress passing something saying you got to be 75. Right. The voters got to be able to vote and they have to be responsible for who they vote for. But I think term limits. Um, yeah. And that's the tough part, man. How do you get the people who are elected to put term limits on themselves? Well, you know how you do it. You hold them accountable. And that's the tough part of things. And, and it's it all comes back to the voters. Um, yeah. Yeah. It all comes back to the voters. So it's a tough one, man. But Menendez out there getting charged. And uh, he's been in the Senate for almost 20 years talking about three businessmen. We know it exists. It's very difficult to get in terms of actual indictments 
and uh, we'll see how that one plays out. Nonetheless, politics, right? But yeah, keep your eye out for term limits, man. We get some billboards uh, on I-4 here in Florida, and they lean a little conservative, but what I love is, is that they're talking about term limits, and I think that's something we can all agree on, and I think that's where the conversation have to, has to shift to, term limits and lobbying. Make some progress, you know? Make some progress on areas that we can, we can all agree on. And I think voters, you know what? How do we get it done? You hold the people that you elect accountable. And that's the only way it happens. And don't get caught up in some of the um, garbage, for lack of a better term, that politics seems to get caught up in. One more segment, folks. We're coming back. We'll talk some options. Stay tuned. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. We got the S&Ps giving it up a bit. We might be negative by the time I get off the air in about three minutes from right now, folks. S&Ps off by three points right now. NASDAQ 100 up by 58. You got the Dow rolling over off 65 points in the Russell, barely holding on to green territory right now. Great conversation going on in the den, man. And this is what, what it's all about, right, in terms of um, – how does this play out, right? How do how do you get something like that term limits? How do you get something like that young blood in there? How do you get, you know, you, you, nobody has all the solutions, folks. Just uh, keep working towards it. Don't give up. You know, that's the that's the truth of of everything. Um, 
And, you know, it's a bummer for everybody in there that's so pessimistic, man. You know, calling America a third world nation and a banana republic. I feel bad for all of you because that's just not the truth. And I don't know what you're watching, where your brain is. Um, America is a great country, folks. We're going to be just fine. Doesn't mean that we can't work towards progress. Uh, but don't caught up, get caught up in um, the rhetoric that so many seem to get caught up in, um, to put it lightly. I mean, think of our history in terms of where we are. All right, jumping over to some options, folks. Next Wednesday, we got our man Teddy Kegstat. He is going to be doing a live webinar, folks. Capitalize on time with calendar stock option spreads. This will be a 60-minute webinar. Teddy's going to be in there. Now, this is a standalone product, okay? You're not signing up for a recurring subscription. You're not signing up for Teddy's Tiger Forex report, which I encourage you to check out as well. He puts out new issues every Monday, and we've seen how important euro, dollar, yen yields crude which he talks about in the tiger forex report but this is its standalone product it's an hour-long webinar and what i always say to people is if you don't even trade options right understanding how they trade is instrumental even to equity traders the cost is 97 dollars to attend talking about calendar spreads and he's going to be in there talking about how to trade stock and other market movements without large capital allocations okay and i mean there's a number of things you can go over there Check it out, folks. That's going to be Wednesday, right after my dad's program, from 4 till 5 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be archived if you can't attend live. And this is one strategy in particular that I struggle to wrap my brain around completely. And so I'm looking forward to it myself. Teddy will be in there next Wednesday. Check it out. It's only $97, folks. Thanks so much for starting your Friday off me, folks. Stay tuned. We got Basil coming up next. We got the Auto Workers Press Conference beginning right now. Lots of market action, folks. Have a great weekend.